For our last segment this evening, I'd like to introduce Dr. Nelson Rodas. Dr. Rodas is a Morris Distinguished Professor and Director of the Division of Oral Medicine in the U of M School of Dentistry. He is also an adjunct professor of otolaryngology in the U School of Medicine and an adjunct professor of epidemiology in the School of Public Health. He also serves on staff of Fairview University of Minnesota Hospital and Cancer Center. Dr. Rodas will discuss how diabetes and how diseases such as cancer, diabetes, and leukemia often first manifest in the mouth and what oral health can reveal about our overall health. Welcome, Dr. Rodas. Thank you, Jim. I'm glad that Brian uh, set the president for bringing down the uh, mic onto the floor because that's my style as well. So good evening, everyone, and uh, welcome. Thank you so much for coming to this event to support the University of Minnesota. Um, I've been at the U for 32 years, and I love it. I have no plans to ever change. People ask me about retirement. I think there's no way I'm ready to retire yet because I have a lot more to do at the U. Uh, so I want to thank you for your support. Um, Obviously, uh, the University of Minnesota and the greater community of the state uh, have a lot of associations, and one of those actually is uh, oral health and dentistry. Um, our dental school at the University of Minnesota is the only regional dental school. Um, there's only uh, one other uh, private school in Wisconsin, none in the Dakotas. Um, so this is our, uh, you know, one of the things that we're really proud uh, to serve Minnesota. and. Um, when we think of uh, dentistry, uh, so it's a good thing you've already had your food because I, I show kind of this ugly picture of teeth. Um, so you typically you think about oral health as being primarily your teeth and, and the way that they look and the way that they function and so forth. Um, and indeed, you know, we always think of that saying, don't look a gift horse in the mouth because indeed when you um, would buy a horse, first thing you do, look in the horse's mouth, see how healthy the horse is. So that's really part of the emphasis now in dentistry is not simply uh, what our teeth mean in themselves, but more importantly, I think, what the reflection of overall health. And that's kind of been my orientation for the last several years in my research and my practice is to correlate um, the association between what we can see and learn about the oral cavity and how it relates to what happens in, in the overall health of individuals uh, and vice versa. Uh, so when you think about oral health, obviously you can't detach the mouth from the rest of the body. Um, and indeed, as I mentioned, it's, it's really a reflection. What we see going on in the oral cavity uh, can indeed be sometimes the very first indication that we see of something uh, that may not actually even be diagnosed in an individual, uh, but, but can be um, an ensuing uh, chronic sort of health problem. Um, part of what we do and what we emphasize is the, what the dentist much, must really know and take into consideration about your health before you come into the into their office. Um, so again, indeed, it's not simply just looking at your teeth um, independent of uh, the function of the rest of your system, uh, but rather is something that uh, we must, uh, before we even address your teeth problems, know about your overall uh, over health, oral health, uh, systemic health. So part of that, of course, is the history, you know, what sort of medical conditions the person might present with. We actually have good data to show that the average dental patient who enters a practice today has um, at least uh, two or three, 40 percent of us have at least two or three medical conditions that the dentist should recognize and take into consideration before we undertake any, di any uh, dental treatment. Uh, part of this, of course, is because of the advances in medical technology. We have uh, so many more um, technologies that will help keep us healthy for a long period of time. And in, in relation to that, we're also keeping our teeth longer. Um, so it's not unusual for me to uh, counsel one of our dental students uh, to do a dental implant in someone 80 years old who has had a couple of double bypass surgeries. So we didn't used to do that. When I was a dental student, about half the people uh, that we treated in dentistry had no teeth. Um, so we were simply performing dentures. So today it's completely different, both because of medical uh, technology advances and dental technology advances. Uh, so I don't know how well you can see this, but just simply a statement. I was invited to write this article for the Minnesota Medical Journal uh, because the physicians are interested in knowing more about oral health. 
So this is something uh, that to me is very obvious, um, something intuitive we should really, of course, know about overall uh, health as, as well as oral health. Um, so the dentists have always been interested in knowing about uh, medical conditions before commencing treatment on a patient. But now, uh, as I say, there are many conditions that the physician is interested in because the physician obviously wants to make sure that whatever treatment is being done, whether it's a um, prosthetic hip or treating someone's diabetes or uh, cancer chemotherapy or getting a liver transplant, that those, that those um, procedures are going to be successful. And sometimes the success depends on how healthy we are generally, including oral health. So it's equally as important for physicians to know about oral health as it is for dentists. Uh, there are a lot of these conditions that are increasing. This, for example, 40% increase in patients with heart failure over the past 20 years. And that's a good thing because more people are living with chronic heart disease uh, because now we can prolong life in people that have had a heart attack or we can intervene with angioplasties and that sort of thing. But what that means is we have people who are living longer with chronic medical conditions who also will require more advanced elaborate types of dental procedures, which put an impact on uh, your ability to undergo and to tolerate and recover from those dental procedures. Um, so another thing is the advance in pharmacology. So a lot of new drugs that are on the market, and you see these advertised every time you watch TV. Uh, for example, anticoagulants like Eliquis or Perdaxa or uh, uh, Plavix. So we're using these drugs uh, much more commonly today. And, and all of these drugs are a fantastic thing. They're really helping to uh, preserve the health of individuals and to uh, uh, treat chronic conditions so that they don't progress. But this does present a problem for your dentist because pretty much every dentist, every appointment, make, we make you bleed. So if you're going to bleed, we need to know about it because we don't want you to have too much of a problem bleeding because I might have other plans later this evening. So don't want to have to come to the office. So essentially what this is doing for us in dentistry is being able to uh, look at someone who actually looks healthy. You know, I look out there and I see most of you look great. You look wonderful. You look healthy. You look interested. You're not too bored yet. And, um, but I don't really know about you. I don't know your actual health or what uh, conditions you might have. So obviously, if I was going to provide dental treatment to you, I would need to know much more about some of the potential complications that you could encounter if I'm going to provide treatment. Um, there are also a lot of conditions that manifest in the head and neck. Um, so uh, the dentistry today has changed because we are playing much more, um, what I would say, a primary healthcare role in recognizing conditions early that may not be diagnosed. So your physician, um, maybe something has developed since the last time you saw your physician. Or many of our dental patients come to us for treatment, they haven't seen their physician in three or four years. So some condition might have progressed unknowingly to them. So it really is our responsibility now in dentistry to help to recognize when people might have these chronic conditions. And, and so many of these will occur in the head and neck. For example, here you see uh, lymphoma uh, in the head and neck. Uh, Flip Saunders, of course, I had uh, lymphoma, so I, I put that there. Uh, but this is one of the conditions. Um, as I mentioned, many of the medications that patients are taking, um, Today, we are a culture of taking many different medications. Medications have a lot of side effects, and some of those side effects include uh, oral cavity problems, propensity to gum disease, to cavities, to dry mouth, to infections in the oral cavity. Uh, but beyond that, per perhaps they could present a complication for undergoing dental treatment. So typically in dentistry, we're going to use some anesthetic. Um, so if uh, a person has a sensitivity because of another drug, an antihypertensive drug or another cardiovascular effect drug, that could have a huge impact on um, that person's ability to undergo the dental treatment. Um, we have actually been asked by the Minnesota Department of Health, I'm, I'm a liaison to the Minnesota Department of Health, and we've been asked to screen uh, blood pressure for individuals because, again, a lot of people come to the dentist and may not have an idea that they're hypertensive. And Fully, 50% of the dental patients that enter our uh, dental school are unaware that they have hypertension. So either they aren't aware of it or they aren't managing it. And not only, of course, is that an impact for us in dentistry, because we pretty much also, along with making you bleed, we make your blood pressure go up just <laughs> virtually every time you come to the dentist. But it's also important on that 
uh, episodic visit to the dentist, but it's also, of course, important long-term because as your blood pressure goes higher and higher over time, undetected, you're at much higher risk for a heart attack or a stroke. So this is a, a role that dentistry is now uh, undertaking is to be a healthcare screener uh, for many of these chronic conditions. And, and we know, we've done a, a studies at the dental school um, showing uh, not only the impact of people with uh, hypertension and the management of that and how it relates to their overall health, not just their dental health. Um, so again, I'll, I'll kind of skip through that. I want to mention again a cardiovascular problem that can occur. There's been a long controversy about bacteria from the oral cavity because um, your, your oral cavity typically is, has, have a lot of bacteria in it. And so anytime the oral mucosa is abrogated, you have some sort of wound, or even brushing and flossing your teeth, but certainly if you have a dental procedure done, bacteria go into your bloodstream. And so then once, of course, those bacteria go to the bloodstream, they can go anywhere, including your heart. So this is someone who didn't volunteer to give us the specimen because they actually died of infective endocarditis. And uh, without going into a lot of detail, there, this is part of the research that we actually do at the university is looking at the type of bacteria that might enter into your bloodstream after a dental procedure, an extraction, a cleaning, a simple filling, a root canal, and see what actually happens to those bacteria. Where do they go? Is it possible that they could go into a joint space? Is it possible that they could go into a blood vessel in your brain or your kidney or, as in this case, in your heart? And there is a good association, of course, that if you have pre-existing dental disease, periodontal disease and so forth, and a lot of infection, obviously that increases your risk for a bacterial um, infection and then that bacteria going to any part of your body. Um, so that, kind of that being said, there are some um, recommendations that are made for anyone who has any cardiovascular disease. So if you yourself or your family um, have such a condition, then you, you certainly want to make your dentist aware of that uh, so that prevention can be uh, undertaken. Uh, but also, as you see here, a careful dental evaluation is also recommended to the physician. So if the physician is going to be doing a procedure, particularly an invasive cardiovascular procedure, they really want you to, to have a good dental evaluation and make sure your oral health is optimal. Because again, uh, th the procedure that they're gonna do, an invasive cardiovascular procedure, procedure a liver transplant, um, a prosthetic knee or a prosthetic hip, they don't want anything to go wrong with that. Um, so obviously the bacteria or an infection from the oral cavity could easily go into uh, the system and, and create a problem. So obviously we, um, not only the dentist is going to be aware, but also the, the surgeons. Uh, just a little cartoon here. I wanted to put in a couple of Oli and Lena jokes, Dutch, but my wife told me I, I probably shouldn't do that. Uh, but this is just a little one here. Do you know the difference between major surgery and minor surgery? I give up. Well, minor surgery is on somebody else. So if it's, if it's dental, it's not minor, and I'm sure you can relate to that. Uh, but here, you know, is an example, again, of a, a hip uh, replacement. Uh, these are very common. They're great. Um, anyone who's had to have a joint replaced, you know how much better your quality of life is. You can move better. Um, you, you have less pain. You have less dis disability. Um, so we're going to continue to see this. But this is something that actually can uh, have an impact um, on the healing or recurrent infections of a prosthetic joint infection with the bacteria in the oral cavity. So again, something that we're very concerned about and we want to make sure that uh, we know what is the best recommendation to give dentists about um, prophylaxing with antibiotics if necessary or, or treating or recognizing these conditions. Um, this is just another uh, condition that's emerged in the last few years, people taking bisphosphonate drugs like Fosamax. I won't ask for a show of hands, but anybody here taking Fosamax? Uh, there's a condition, uh, Fosamax is great, and, and other uh, IV um, bisphosphonate drugs that prevent osteoporosis or cancer uh, mets and that sort of thing, um, that it can cause this osteonecrosis of the jaw. So again, we're very interested in trying to find out the whole pathophysiology of this and what happens and why people are susceptible to it, and then of course launch initiatives to prevent this from happening in anyone. Obviously, uh, no one would want to undergo something like this. Uh, so there's preventive practices. Um, diabetes. Diabetes is significantly increasing. Uh, by the year 2020, which is just coming up in four years, um, in the last 20 years, diabetes will quadruple type 2 diabetes. So about 10% of our adult population will be diabetic. 
uh, in about four years. So I, diabetes has, of course, a lot of repercussions itself because it renders you more susceptible to heart disease and, of course, a number of other things, kidney disease and so forth. But it certainly also has a big role in dentistry because uh, we call this kind of a bi-directional effect. The, the more the diabetes is a problem for the patient, the worse the, the oral care is, their, their oral disease, periodontal disease and so forth, and vice versa. The worse the periodontal disease, the worse the diabetes will become. Um, so there are a number of different consequences. Uh, well, these are just a few other ugly pictures that you just love to see of the oral cavity. Of the, this is uh, ca caries and bone loss and a lot of bone loss here in individuals and uh, infections and so forth that occur. So we know that about uh, in, our, in our practice, nearly 30% of the people who come in are not well controlled on their diabetes. So again, this is a role that dentistry can recognize that pa patients are not controlling their diabetes very well. And we can play a role in helping them to uh, control the diabetes, not only again for the dental aspects, but for their overall general health aspects. Um, there are a lot of complications that occur in the oral cavity, and we actually can tell that. I can basically look in your mouth, if you're diabetic, and tell whether, what your hemoglobin A1C is. I can pretty much tell whether you're under good control or not, because there are many of these manifestations will, that will occur. And again, as I mentioned, controlling that will not only help the diabetes, but it will also, of course, help your oral condition. And so a lot of things, uh, increased uh, caries and gingivitis and periodontal disease and, and many more dental infections, oral infections that can occur if you have, uh, if you have diabetes. Uh, so, and, and this just shows uh, here, this is a study that we did that shows uh, glycemic control. So the blood sugar control actually improves periodontal health and then periodontal health in turn uh, helps the, the level of glycemic control. So it's just, a, again, an illustration of how systemic health and oral health uh, work with each other. So they both, uh, and, and even the gopher gets his free cleaning twi twice a year at the dental school. Uh, so just one other couple of things I want to mention, periodontal disease and the risk for heart attack. So we actually have a, a number of studies that are actually showing this correlation with bacteria from the oral cavity entering your bloodstream, going into your cardiovascular system, possibly contributing to atherosclerosis, and again, the likelihood of possibly having an, an occlusion uh, and a heart attack or a stroke. So there is an association again with uh, when you go home tonight, be sure you floss and brush really good because you don't want to have a heart attack. Um, and these are other associations here. Uh, my friend uh, uh, Brian McLeos asked him to write this. This is Northwest Dentistry. This is our dental journal for the um, Minnesota Dental Association. That there's so many things that are actually associated with periodontitis, like uh, as we already saw, diabetes and low birth weight and Alzheimer's and uh, osteoporosis. So uh, again, you think of it in a way it makes common sense. You have a chronic infection in a part of your body. And if that chronic infection is producing a bacterial uh, blood burden, uh, bacteremia, so to speak, ongoing 24-7, there's a possibility that something can happen. Uh, and there's association here you can see with other things, Alzheimer's and dental health, dementia and tooth loss, and so forth. Um, just a few other things. Correlation here with a person with uh, head and neck, uh, lymph nodes and swollen salivary glands with jaundice. Uh, lymphomas that can occur in the mouth and oral cavity. Uh, acute leukemia. Some of the very first signs that we see, signs and symptoms of leukemia, actually are in the oral cavity. Uh, someone with HIV AIDS, so many of these conditions. So the last thing I want to share with you, to me, is the most exciting, just the last couple of minutes. So Brian, I asked Brian to give me the five-minute sign, so I know I'm at the end here, but I think this, for me, is the most exciting. But first of all, uh, since we are hockey state, I had to just put this cartoon in. So the freezer broke at Mariucci last night. By the end of the game, there were seven feet of water, so they had to take out the first string and put in the subs. Okay. I got to laugh. That's good. I'm looking at my wife there, she says. No, no more jokes. So what I want to talk about is spit, uh, because that's actually been the focus of my research for about the last 20 years, because looking at saliva. So we just talked about blood, and you think about blood and bacteria and, and the things that are going on in your body being obviously measured in blood, like blood glucose and so forth, leukemia. Uh, but saliva actually is a product of blood. And it's very similar. So what we see in saliva being secreted from your saliva glands with a direct blood supply actually has many of the same constituents that we actually see in blood. 
So one of our interests has been not only, of course, dental disease, because saliva has a lot to do with development of gum disease or periodontal disease and caries. If you get uh, low salivary flow, you're going to get more oral disease, because saliva is very protective of the oral cavity. But beyond that, we've learned a lot about specific proteins in saliva that have other roles, that have roles, for example, in diabetes, that have roles in, in, in cancer, not only oral cancer, but in other types of cancer. And so we've been really interested in looking at individuals who present. Um, this is my focus, my specialty actually is oral cancer. And so what we're really focused on is not simply the people that already have oral cancer, but more people that have the possibility of developing cancer. So they don't have it yet, but they have that likelihood of developing it. And oral cancer actually is probably, um, many people aren't aware of just how deadly it is. It's only a 50% five-year survival rate. So that's actually worse than many of the other, well, I showed you Hodgkin's lymphoma, it's actually worse than Hodgkin's lymphoma. Uh, ovarian cancer. It's, it's worse than a lot of those. So, and it really hasn't improved very much simply because we don't diagnose it early enough. So this has been our focus at the U, is actually to develop a uh, early detection model. And um, the American Dental Association is behind this, the National Cancer Institute is behind this, and we've gotten support from all of them. But just to really uh, cut to the chase here on, on our work, uh, so oral cancer actually progresses through several stages. It actually starts off as a benign lesion in the oral cavity. Uh, something chronic that doesn't go away. Often it's a white patch or a leukoplakia in the oral cavity. And some of those, over time, they will progress to full-fledged can cancer. And there are some specific changes that occur in the DNA. So cancer, at the end of the day, is a dysregulation of your, of your DNA. Something's gone wrong with the uh, DNA in the nucleus of your cells. It's mutated or it's altered and so forth. So what we're interested in, in is looking does some of these changes in the DNA of the cells get into the saliva? And if we can measure it in saliva, then we would know that this is someone who's actually developing cancer. And so indeed, that's what we've been able to do. Uh, with technology today, the Human Genome Project, we can pretty much look at every one of your uh, genes um, in your 46 chromosomes, and we can determine just what uh, some of those genes have to do with your susceptibility to certain conditions, and then also the progression of those conditions. So we can take that, and then look at specific biomarkers. This is our translational uh, research facility. It's right behind TCF Stadium. There's those new buildings right over there behind TCF, if you ever go there. Uh, so we're really interested here in looking at oral cancer, uh, salivary levels, and I won't bore you with all of these specific research projects, but uh, suffice it to say that what we're looking at are specific markers. So sort of like with breast cancer, you know about the BRCA genes. With prostate cancer, you know we have a PSA. This has a, some sort of utility in maybe determining if, if a man is going to progress to prostate cancer. So that's really what we're doing, is looking at specific biomarkers that have a really good uh, sensitivity and specificity for telling us that this is a person who's going to develop oral cancer. Patron saint of dentistry. Uh, and, and this also includes, you probably heard a little bit about the new developments in oral pharyngeal cancer with HPV. So uh, I sit on the tumor board of the Head and Neck Cancer uh, Center at the university, and we see a lot more people coming in today with uh, HPV-related cancer. So, and and um, as you see here, a lot of new infections per year. So we actually are looking at determining HPV in, in saliva. And individuals, again, who may be able to be screened, possibly through your dentist, possibly through your primary care physician, possibly in your home uh, to have a screening test. Um, and then this sort of, there's some serendipity, of course, that always occurs in research. And so what we were able to find is some specific biomarkers in your saliva that aren't even head and neck or oral cancer. And most um, of these occur because the tumor, wherever it occurs, if it's in your colon or in your liver or in your pancreas or in your breast, that some of those tumor products are going to get into the blood and then they're also going, going to get into the saliva. So we can look at the DNA in blood or saliva and look for these specific genes, and we've actually been able to do that from the tumor going into the bloodstream, into the saliva, and then measuring that, and even with breast cancer. So we, we have a number of studies that have shown uh, obviously breast cancer, 41,000 deaths a year, a major problem, and we've actually been able to detect uh, specific salivary proteins um, in people with breast cancer that will give us a 
an idea of uh, the earliest possible detection. So again, our in interest and our focus isn't so much on just determining the cancer itself, but actually the people in the very earliest stages. Because obviously, like any disease, if you can treat it early, you have a much better prognosis for the overall outcome and survival. Um, so just for an example here, we've seen uh, mammoglobulin B, which is well-known circulating uh, breast cancer marker in saliva as an indicator of people, particularly women, of course, who may progress with, uh, with breast cancer. So um, the last part, um, technology, we have a great engineering uh, technology department they use. So we're actually partnering with them and two other universities, UCLA and Rice, on uh, developing a little handheld instrument. So you take a little drop of saliva here, put on a little card reader, and then actually get a little readout of what's going on in the saliva for oral cancer, breast cancer, possibly colon cancer, uh, esophageal cancer, and so forth. And we're in the, in the uh, stage now developing prototypes so we could actually use this in the field. So with that, I think I'm at the end. <laughs> I'm going to stop here, and I really do appreciate your attention. Thanks very much. Time for one, one or two questions. Yes. If you find like a pre-cancer cell, is there something you can do to reverse it? Yeah. So that's a great question. Thanks. I'll give you the ten bucks after after we're asking. <laughs> No, that was going to be a couple more slides, so I'm like, Brian, I have a lot. I just could go on forever. I love it. Um, no, that's a great question. So what do you do? Typically, we cut it out. So in the stages of cancer, virtually any type of cancer, the first stage, if it's relatively small and hasn't spread to regional lymph nodes or someplace else, another organ system, usually you do surgery first. And, uh, but if it's more invasive, then you have to go to surgery and radiation. And then if it's even more invasive, you go to surgery and radiation and chemotherapy. Um, so what we're hopeful is if we can find it in the very, very early stages, we could maybe even wouldn't have to do surgery. We could focus maybe a little radiation beam, uh, image-guided radiotherapy where we actually focus it. It's sort of a smart bomb, kind of zips in and just destroys the, the tumor. Uh, otherwise, we actually have a drug study that we have from the National Cancer Institute of, of Health. Now we have a grant to look at a particular drug that would stop this pre-malignant lesion from ever becoming cancer to begin with. So we could actually stop the cancer from developing even before it starts. So that's, that's our goal at this point. Yes, sir. Oh, yeah, that's a great question, too. So the knee replacement. So this is a big controversy. I look at Suzette here. She's a practicing dentist in Little Falls, one of, one of my grads. And so she knows that this is a real controversy. All the data would show that there really is not a risk if you have a prosthetic joint in a dental. It doesn't matter how much of a dental infection you have. That It's very unlikely that that would go to a knee or a hip. But generally speaking, what we would recommend is waiting at least 30 days. To, before you do any invasive dental treatment. And I would even recommend three months. It's better just to wait any kind of surgery you have, cardiovascular surgery, bypass, angioplasty, knee surgery, any major surgery, I would really recommend. This is what we recommend to our students and residents at the U. If you can, it's best just to wait three months. Let everything kind of heal. Let the person feel better before you do a dental procedure. Now, obviously, you could get a toothache. Uh, you know, something could go bad, and you get a tooth that blows up, and then we have to treat that. I would even recommend postponing a cleaning if you can. I, I would recommend the ideally the three month window, definitely the thirty day window. Yes, sir. Yeah, I'm just going to add on to that. I had a knee replacement about five years ago, and you know I've been having to take the pills before I go to you. But I understand that there's been some shift in that now, and it's not so important if you're going for a, a checkup or a cleaning. Not that you don't have to take those pills anymore. Yes, that's absolutely, absolutely true. We were actually part of that, the, the research that, that um, led to that study. And the Mayo Clinic, there's a big study at the Mayo Clinic. So the Mayo doesn't pre-medicate with antibiotics anybody anymore, period. They just decided we don't need to do that. Uh, we're a little more conservative because we're a teaching institution. Uh, but we, by and large, uh, we do not recommend. So certainly if it's been there for five years, no need. Thank you so much. I think I'm out of time, but thanks so much. For